if you're a CEO and you're just driven by business, which you know entrepreneurs really are, you've got to find a passion. She Back. wanted to diversify her risk, is what she wanted, because she didn't. She knew you were great, but she didn't know which one of your ideas was going to hit. I'm so passionate. I'd like to show you how good I am as someone who can create value for you. I know this sounds. What do you mean? Don't pay me. Do you think there are common successful attributes? in people. And I guess what she's asking is, can you find a string of things that that is the same for people that are successful? Do they all do the same thing? Well, of course they don't all do the same thing, but I have found over time in working with lots of CEOs, and that's business, but also artists, musicians, photographers, you know, those kinds of watch collectors. There are some elements of their lives that I find are consistent. And I want to share them with you today. First of all, this, this concept of priorities. Now, I learned this from you know, a woman CEO years ago to actually carry with you all the time, and I have it right here. If I don't have my big notebook, I carry a small one with me, paper, just paper. And what I've got in here are notes, and I carry a pen with me all the time. I love to collect pens. This is a, a new Egyptian Mont Blanc. When I know I, when something hits me, wherever I am, I remember to write it down. And the reason I do that is I build a priority set that I put down each night. And out of all the priorities of the day, I carry three into the next day. Because you can even see, here's a day, you can see that a bunch of stuff has been, a bunch of priorities there, but I've I basically done them, I got them done. But this idea of um, prioritizing ends up being a really big deal. So that's attribute number one. Politicians, teachers, generals, CEOs, they build a data set in their heads of things they've got to get done. And they don't do anything else until they've achieved those. For me, it's sticking out on the mirror each night. I've talked about this countless times. And I don't do anything else until I get those three done. And they're built from the list that I generate during the day. So definitely for all successful people, regardless of what their discipline is, that idea of priority really matters. Number two, you may find this interesting, but it's, it's looking good and feeling good. You know, I don't go out into the sun, and I've talked about them before, Tish Hanley, skin creams and things that are really healthy for you, particularly for me, SPF, at least SPF 20. You know, I got the chrome dome, I gotta make sure it's looking good all the time. Before I came out here, I put some moisturizer on, so I dip into my kit, my Tee Hanley kit, I find my morning application. It's all right on here. It says moisturizer with SPF 20. Exactly what I need. Protect the dome, don't let it burn around the nose and the eyes. That easy. And what I like about them is they send me a kit. It's got an instruction card in it. Um, I don't have to think it through. Basically each vial or bottle or, you know, tube tells me exactly what it's for. It's really easy to implement. It doesn't have any smelly perfumes, which I hate. So I'm constantly using it. Um, and you know, because they're sponsoring this, this uh, YouTube video today, I, I obviously asked them for a deal. They're going to include a free toiletry bag. If you go to the first link in the description, you can get it there. Check that out. Tease Handley. Uh, I endorse it because I use it. I don't endorse products I don't use. But hey, you got to have the dome looking good all the time. And skin, you've got to keep it moisturized and you've got to keep it out of the sun. I don't care who you are. That really matters. Now, something else that's really important is, and I can't stress this enough, and the more I experience this with people, the more I believe it to be true. You have to have another passion besides the one that is your discipline. In other words, if you're a teacher, you have to do something else about that's not teaching. If you're a CEO and you're just driven by business, which you know entrepreneurs really are, you've got to find a passion. That's really important. And I don't care whether it's music or whether it's playing an instrument or it's collecting watches. I love to do that too. You can have multiple passions. I, you know, I love pens. I love watches. I love guitars. I love photography. They distract me from the intensity of my core discipline, which is business. I'm an investor, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I invest in companies, I try and help them work. 
and that gives me financial freedom, which of course is very important, but I got to do something else. I, I have to. And, you know, that I find more and more is a really big deal with successful people. They're very disciplined in what they do well, in their main focus in life, yes, but they've also got other passion. It can be a single passion or it can be multiple. And that yin and yang, which I've spoken of so many times, is so important. There's no question about that. You know, when I really think through uh, what, it, what has helped me so much and, and those that I really follow and that I admire, you know, everybody's got a mentor and there's always somebody that's more successful than you and you can learn from them. I don't care how successful you are. There's always somebody that's better and you should realize that in your life and that's okay. There's always something to learn. But those people to me look good, they feel good, they have priorities and they make sure that they attempt some kind of yin and yang. I didn't say balance, because if you're an entrepreneur, there's no balance. You're going to be working 25 hours a day, eight days a week. I mean, that's just the way it is, but you can find the time to be productive in that way. It doesn't mean, you know, you abandon your family and all that stuff. I'm talking about the intensity of your focus. And so I wanted to get that out. I really, I really felt that, you know, answering, I've got so many questions along the same line that that's basically the way I feel about it. It's, it's not it's not something that you immediately find intuitive, but you will find over time that these attributes matter. So let's summarize. Prioritization, putting that list together, writing it down really works. Looking good, feeling good, taking care of yourself, no question about it. You know, being extremely focused on your own discipline is great, but have other passions. Watch collecting, love that. I've talked about music, all that stuff. You gotta do all that. You have to find that yin and yang. And all of a sudden you'll find a new energy that comes up if you try and follow these disciplines. Life's really interesting that way. You're always learning from it. You know, because we talk about entrepreneurship so much in the journey and the talent, the challenge of doing it, I thought we'd bring on someone who's actually been on Shark Tank not once, twice. This guy's a crazy chicken, and even to talk yourself on a Shark Tank twice is impossible, so he's done it, and who knows, he might be the only person that can come on three times, but he's got the energy. I'll let him introduce himself, and then we're going to take a whole bunch of questions from Ask Mr. Wonderful viewers, but we've got an entrepreneur here extraordinaire, Aaron. Kevin, thank you so much. No problem. So my name is Aaron Marino. I have the YouTube channel Alpha M, and um, basically from this channel, it allowed me to start different verticals and different businesses. I think that at my core, I'm an entrepreneur. It just happened that my business um, that I wanted to basically start from the age of 12 was a fitness center. I knew at 12 years old what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. You know, everything leading up to the point at which I actually opened a fitness center, that's what it was about. From 12 years old, I wanted to help people change their lives. And um, you know, as, as you know, entrepreneurship is not a straight line. And it was, it was the most devastating thing that happened when I had to end up shutting the business down back in uh, 2006. Because poo poo happens. Well, it happens and it happened a lot. I think there, there should have been an omen. We signed the lease to our facility on the September 11th. That was pretty much a telltale sign of how everything was gonna unfold. But I think that's a very important list for everybody listening because just because you assume success, just because you have the energy, just because you have the desire, doesn't mean it's gonna happen for you on the first time. In fact, I believe that entrepreneurs that go through the sting of failure are motivated in a very special way afterwards. And clearly in your case, that's been exactly what's happened because there's been a lot of shit hits you. And somehow, here we are, you're very successful now, which is, I'm so happy to have you on my channel because I wanna talk a little bit about that journey. But you actually have a unique amount of aura and energy, and that's the reason that you've been on Shark Tank twice, because when you came on the first time, I thought you were a real dick, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Me, you yeah, were absolutely. the dick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the idea was so preposterous, the idea that you were gonna sell a style system. 300 bucks. I know, but it, DVDs. You know, I, and the whole idea was so crazy, but because your, your storytelling was so compelling, you actually got people seriously considering it. I nearly had to go down the line to the other sharks and say, look, no one's giving this guy any dough. This is way too crazy. But you were very good at explaining why it might have value to somebody, and that's part of the challenge of being an entrepreneur, to be able to explain your opportunity in a very short, concise period of time, which you were very good at. But after that, 
you came back, and which is remarkable. And let's talk about that experience. What was that like? First the, of all, being one, I think it's less than 1% ever get back. Yeah, no, Shark Tank is, is, is amazing. And it, it's, a, it's a shame that, that people don't really understand like what really goes into it. They only see a small window of what happens well, when you're on Well, here's the, a chance for you to tell. It is brutal. <laughs> it is, I mean, and the one thing that you're gonna notice, if I tell you this, it sort of ruins it. You, your mouth gets so dry when you're out there. Because and you're, you're scared shitless. You're scared right? shitless. Yeah. And so you're there and, and, and lights, camera, action, and there is no stop. There is no, okay, do that again. It's like, go, go, go. And, and you get grilled. And that's what I was not expecting. I was not expecting, even though I watched it hundreds of times, I was not expecting the questions to be not only as direct and, and sort of cut through all the bullshit. Like it was, this is what it's about, you know, and I wasn't prepared for that. Even though I knew my numbers, I was prepared. And so the first time was kind of a disaster. I was so excited to be on, and I knew that I was gonna, it didn't matter what you guys said, I knew that I was going to sell a ton of style systems afterwards, and the night the Shark Tank aired, I had all my friends and family there, everybody's there, and I'm sitting there, and I had my, my computer out, and I was ready to see that, that, that dollar amount just start to, to ring, and I sold one unit the night the Shark Tank aired. Like eight which, million Which, people. by the way, is probably the worst performance of any product ever in Shark Tank history because the idea sucked. That's why, and I think I told you, because I am Mr. Wonderful, I tell the truth. It sucked, but you came back. But, so the reality hit me in the face. All right, this is not Thank working. Goodness. This is not working. And so there I was about a month later. I knew that I needed a lower price point product, something that every guy needed. Yeah, because your deal was 300 bucks, right? Yeah, 300 bucks. Crazy. It was, a, it was an information Shame product. on you, Shame crazy. On... <laughs> I sold one, shut up. <laughs> you, so, made, you made hundreds of dollars. Exactly, I did, I made hundreds. And so I was, I was styling my hair when inspiration st struck. My YouTube channel was all about helping guys look and feel great and hair products were one of those things where I was passionate about and I loved. And so I thought, you know, I'm gonna start a, I'm gonna start a hair product business. And um, it's been sort of a wild ride ever since. Um, the YouTube channel continues to grow. I came back on Shark Tank for the hair product um, and nobody wanted to invest in the product. No, because but first of all, your premise was for men, right? Yes. Which is a brutally competitive space. And everybody's question was the same. What's your customer acquisition strategy? Because you're competing with some of the giants on earth. Some of the biggest companies on earth are in this space and they're beating each other up. And here you are. Are Aaron saying, hey, hey, I'm here for a second time on Shark Take. I've got another crazy idea. Please give me some money. But I gotta, I gotta defend myself for a second. If anybody else would have gone in the Shark Tank, if they if I didn't have the the backing or the reason I was selling was because of my YouTube channel. If I went in there or an entrepreneur went in there with a business that in two years made a million dollars, it does and and the margins were great, growing at a fast rate everybody would have been throwing money at him, but because I had this Well, mechanism. we didn't have the future in front of us. We only had your second idea. The first one absolutely sucked. We all remember <laughs> that. And we're thinking, why is this guy back? The reason you were back is you are tremendously good television, which is a great message to everybody out there. You have such energy and such an aura and the camera likes you so much that the producer said, one more time with feeling from this guy, because everybody knows sometimes the second time up at bat is when you hit the home run. And so I did. I, I got a deal with Barbara, but she didn't want to invest in the in the hair product business. Yeah, and because so, she still thought it sucked. No, she didn't think it sucked. She, but she was investing in, in. To your point, she wanted a piece of my my YouTube channel. Now this was. She back wanted to diversify her risk, is what she wanted, because she didn't. She knew you were great, but she didn't know which one of your ideas was going to hit. Which is fair. I'll speak for her. I would have done the same thing with you. In fact, I would have been much tougher. But the point was that she was saying, look, I know something's gonna work for this guy because he's got such an incredible amount of energy. I don't know what it's going to be. And that's exactly what happened. So fast forward, I didn't end up taking the deal. Um, since then, I've been able to start a few other businesses, um, basically leveraging my, my ability to, you know, communicate and, and have a large following. So on which ones actually worked? The hair product business worked. It's, uh, it's what are the sales of that thing? Right now, this past year? Barbara, you bozo, you let that get away? <laughs> I can't believe it. Shame on you. Man, so, imagine that dog, that piece of poo-poo was doing a million dollars. That's I didn't think we were gonna get to the numbers, so that was one. Why business. not, I'm all about numbers. That's not, and so that's, that's 
that's not, so I have other businesses as well. Um, I don't want to go into the numbers with all of them. But that's a pretty good number. That's that, a pretty good number for a product they really thought was going to suck. So then my largest business is a skincare company called Tiege Hanley. Yeah. That is a uh, men's skincare subscription business. I have a advertising agency that I started as a result of not being able to sell my, I didn't want to sell advertising to my channel. I wanted somebody else to do it. And so I hired my best friend from high school, Terry, who is a car salesman, an amazing car salesman. And from moment one, everything took off in terms of you know, so, sponsorships. So just, just tease us. What's the big nut? What are you going to do in sales this year across all this stuff? A lot. Like, just give me a number. I mean, a lot. Come on. Uh, see, see, here's where, here's where. I, it's, Listen, a lot is can mean two dollars. It's yeah. more than one dollar. That's yeah. a lot. Or it can mean something substantive. What do you yeah, got? But, what about you? Hey, come on. Listen, <laughs> I'm asking you let's, because let's just you're like, the one that got out of the tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want Barbara to hear just how. Yeah, good oh, it is. you know, eight figures in that, in that, in that. More area. than ten million. More than ten million. More than twenty million. More than. We'll just get, let's just leave it there. We're, we're, we're Barbara, doing Barbara, well. Barbara, Barbara, I'm going to buy you a new broom <laughs> so you can fly here right now to meet Aaron again. New broom for you, exactly. Barbara, right over here. You can fly, she can fly on a broom. She can, uh, you know what, love Barbara. But, uh, but no, everything, <laughs> everything is great. Um, I am incredibly fortunate that I get to do what I love every day, which is create content and the fact that, you know, being an entrepreneur and having that in my DNA and my blood you know, you never know where opportunity and the, you never know which one is going to work. Exactly. And you got to keep your eyes open because what. But that's why I'm glad we're here today together because we've got, I, I get thousands of questions from entrepreneurs that were actually at the beginning of your journey. Maybe they failed once, maybe they haven't even started yet. That's why I want to tap into you today on these Ask Mr. Wonderful questions. I got a bunch of them here. Great. Let's listen. And then I want us both to answer them from the different perspectives we have because you have come out of a hole. You have a little story on this watch before we start, yeah. right? Yep. This is a beautiful Rolex. You know, I'm a watch collector. Yep. I really appreciate that. It's a gorgeous rose gold piece, but it's got an inscription on the back of it. What does it say? Yeah, um, most people, it's funny. Most people celebrate victories or wins or benchmarks in their business by, by buying nice watches or they'll buy a watch to represent some point. Some deal, some, that's some, what some I good, do. Some that's good, what I do. Something good. And a celebration of success. I bought this watch when things were bad in terms of, and, and bad is relative. Because that's not a cheap piece. No, but I, I had my eye on it and I was going through sort of a low point in terms of emotionally, you know, things with YouTube weren't going in the direction that I wanted, but I bought it to remind myself that as long as I keep trying, as long as I don't stop, it'll get better and I can do this. And so on the back, I, I, uh, I had inscribed, get to work. And so everybody told me, well, that devalues. It says, get to work. It says, get to work. Figure it out. I, initially, I would have said that would have devalued the watch, except since then, maybe that watch is your lucky timepiece because look what's happened to you. Exactly. And you look at it every day and you remind yourself what you put on the back of that at, at your low point. I love that story. Watches are about conversations. We just had one. So that's a very successful piece for you. Because every time someone looks at it and says, oh, I really like that watch, you can tell them the story of that. Absolutely. That's great. I love it. I love that too, that's great. Let's get to some questions, okay? Because we're gonna have some fun here. I mean, I love the fact that you can relate. And I, I, I've not listened to these questions, so they're- Me neither. So we're, we're ready, <laughs> let's go. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. Big fan of the show and all the great insights you've always given. I'm a 24-year-old recent business school grad working as a business development representative at a fashion tech startup that uses AI to automate the fashion photography process here in New York City. I finished college with more debt than originally planned, around 21000 I want to save and invest in the future so I can start my own business one day. I believe I need to eliminate all my debt before saving and investing, and of course eventually starting my own business. Do you recommend someone in my, posi my position to focus all their extra money, their savings, and commissions towards my student debt, or is it advantageous to do a little bit of both, save and invest, as well as pay off the debt, even if it'll take more time? Thanks, Mr. Wonderful. I've always resonated with your story growing up as an expat with you and myself. I love your videos. Any advice would be great. Thanks. You know what's cool about this question? It's in your space. It's in fashion. A little bit. Yeah, but the guy is $21,000 in the hole. He hasn't even brought any revenue in, doesn't have a business yet. What do you tell him? So for me, I think it really depends on, for one, interest rate on that, on that, on that student loan. Call it 7%. 7%. Um, I would probably not wait to start saving for both my, my future in terms of my, my business. It sounds like he's an entrepreneur. He has an idea that he wants to go after. 
Um, I would pay down the debt, but I think that I would be utilizing my, my funds to try to start that business that I, that I ultimately feel will propel me towards success. But, you know, so, so debt freaks you out is what you're saying. I, I don't have any debt. Once I, I had to file bankruptcy. So you, you felt I happens. felt, oh God. You felt yeah. the, the, the terror of that. There's nothing, there's nothing that takes the fun out of life like debt and not knowing how you're going to pay your bills. Well said. And, and for me, when I had my fitness center and it was failing, I was taking money off of my credit cards to pay my staff. I mean, it was bad. And at that point, I, had to drive, I was driving a beer cart to put gas in my car at a country club. And here I am, a 30-year-old guy who has a business, a fitness center that I was trying to franchise, and I'm driving a beer cart. And the worst part about it, Kevin, I didn't have a plan B. I'm the type of entrepreneur that I don't have a safety net. I'm plan A all the time, direct, and when that exploded, I had no fucking idea what I was gonna do, and that was the scariest part so, for me. So I totally agree with you, in that I share, I have no debt, zero. And every time my credit card comes in every month, every cent is paid off, because I live in fear of debt. I've been through that too. I didn't get to bankruptcy, but I got very close, and it scared the living shit out of me. And it made me feel unhealthy. It put so much stress on you. So I think both of us giving the same advice, Number one focus is pay down that $21,000, but don't give up your dream. You have an interesting idea in fashion using AI. I love entrepreneurs with disruptive ideas. He's got one, but that debt thing is a real message in that question. It is, absolutely. And, and, and so, to, you know, that's for everybody with, with college debt. It's between six and 7% most of these loans, they kick up to that rate pretty damn fast. And you've got to start focusing, but whatever you're doing, take 20%, 10% and pay it down. There's also, but there's something also exciting about that because he's in this new space and so, you know, there's, with startups, there's, there is that entrepreneurial spirit. And so you know that there, there's also the idea that if this hits, it could hit big. Right. But there's also a tremendous amount of risk. It may not hit. Exactly. The risk with a startup or something that's unproven, you know, everybody's looking for that exit. And I really think that with certain businesses, you really just need to be smart and disciplined with the way that you spend your money and not yeah. think that and not assume that it's going to hit super big. And so just be careful, pay your debt down because being debt free is the most liberating feeling you'll ever have. Well said. Let's get another question here. I'm Sorry, am I, am I talking more than you? No, Kevin? I'm cool with it. <laughs> well, I, I love the fact that we're doing this together because at the end of the day, you've lived that ride. You've gone through it. And so this is great advice. Let's listen to this one. Again, I've never heard these questions. So I love the fact that just cold turkey. Hey, Mr. Wonderful. Joe here, huge fan. You're my favorite shark. I was just wondering what you do when the woman you love will never love you back. Thanks, Mr. Wonderful. Whoa, Joe, <laughs> baby. You know, this is a good question. It's a great question. You know, I'll tell you something. In life, when you fall in love with somebody and they don't return that, that can be a bad affliction because it really drags your energy down. But at some point, you have to be honest with yourself, particularly when you have that conversation with them. Say, look, is there any chance between the two of us all of us have been there. People try and say, oh, it's never happened to me. Bullshit. It happens to everybody. But that makes you realize they're not your partner. They're not there for you. They don't love you back. And that's just the nature of love. It's a bitch that way. But you have to have that conversation with them. This is my advice to Joe. And say, look, I really have some strong feelings for you. But if you, if you can never reciprocate that, this is a Bonnie Raitt song, by the way. It's a classic, which she professes her love to somebody, and they're never going to love her back. Broke her heart. What do you do? Joe, my advice to you is you got to be honest. The fact is you are amazing, right? You're an incredible guy and you're going to make some woman the luckiest woman ever. But one of the issues that we fall into as men is that we do get sort of tied in and, and preoccupied with that one person, right? And really it's because of something that we can't have, right? The truth is you need to read the writing on the wall and, and it's time for you to take care of yourself and understand that you're never ultimately going to find that perfect person that's out there for you until you are able to shut the door on, on this, this person that, that obviously is not worthy of your love and affection. Do you think as you get a little older, Aaron, that you understand the pitfalls of love and you start to realize, I don't want to drag myself. Maybe you, maybe you become more of an oyster. You protect your emotions because you know how much it hurts. But if you've never been hurt, you can never really fall in love. Absolutely. That's the issue. That's the issue. So I think for Joe, you got to write this one off and you got to move on. Aaron has the right advice there. There's always another fish in the ocean somewhere. By the way, is she really smoking hot? That's breaking your heart? That's the problem? <laughs> you know?
you know, usually that's. Usually the there's something. Stuff, yeah. I'll never meet someone that hot. You will. You absolutely will. You will, Joe. It's. <laughs> you will. Oh, uh, that's that's a tough one. Okay, here we go. Number three. I'm having fun. Are you? I'm having a blast. This is great. All right, here we go. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. Thanks for taking my question. I wondered, uh, when do you know, when is it a good time to add a co-founder to your company? And how much do you offer them? I have a company that I started about a year ago, um, and I think I, I'm ready to add a co-founder to the company, but not sure how much I should offer them. Um, and so I thought I would ask you, Mr. Wonderful. Thanks so much. You know, it's a great question. Well, is it a really co is co-founder? It, is it really a co-founder? No, it isn't. It. It's a partner. She's exactly. talking about. But I mean, here's the real debate that I've learned. You know, you're really good at some things and not good at others. Every entrepreneur is exactly that way. So I'm I'm a good sales marketing person. I hate logistics and manufacturing. It bores the shit out of me. But without that skill set, I can't really scale. So along the way in my businesses, I've always found someone who can make up for my weaknesses. And I've made them partners by giving them equity. They're not really co-founders, as you've said. But in order for them to stick through the hard times and really suffer the pains and slings and arrows of building a business, you got to give them a piece of the action. That's the way I look at it. So if you are actually growing and it's working and you realize you have weaknesses, you've got to find someone else to fill those holes. Now, maybe you can find employees. We're going to have to pay them a lot. I prefer to have people with skin in the game Soldiers beside me, we're all fighting the same war together, and we're in for the mission, and we all get the upside. So I think if you're asking me this question right now, and I'm dying to hear what Aaron has to say, I think you're ready for a partner. But make sure you're not greedy. Don't be a greedy pig. Pigs got slaughtered. If you're, if you're giving away equity, make sure it's the right person. Take a long time to make that decision. But together, you'll make a much bigger pie, and that equity will be worth a lot to both of you. What do you say? The one thing I would say, I have some businesses that I have partners in, some businesses that I don't. And there are upsides to both, both scenarios. Um, the one thing I would say, whenever you are considering adding somebody to the team, to something that you're building, your baby, you want to make sure that it's not only the right fit now, but it's the right fit moving forward. And what I mean by that is, I think too often people are thinking I need to give away too much too soon and they think it's you know it, it has to vest like immediately. I would say that in this scenario find somebody that is going to add value that's going to fulfill or fill the voids in which you know you're not good at and um, and then do it over time. Do it gradually. There's nothing wrong with seeing how this person performs because the worst scenario... So give them the equity as they perform. As they perform. Have it vest Fair over enough. two years, a year. Give them, you know, certain, a little bit of equity, you know, after year one, year two, have different benchmarks. And really, because everybody's going to sell you how great they are. Everybody is going to tell you, yeah, I'm amazing. I can do this. I can do that. But the truth is, it's put up or shut up. And in business... You know, talk is cheap. You've got to actually execute. And, and you've got to make sure that the person that has told you how excellent they are at executing is actually able to do it and help your business move forward. And if it's not, well, then that's but, not but the right you're, person. But you're cool with giving a piece of the pie. Oh, absolutely. You see the merit in doing that. Oh, 100%. I, I do too. But I like your strategy. If you, if you layer it in, that's fine. But by that time, it may be more employees or maybe more people that have to share. And that's what options. Generally, companies put about 15% of their equity into people that are coming on to grow it. You love to have that problem. If you're actually giving away equity because you need more help, that means you're growing. That's a wonderful outcome. I wish them good luck on that one. It's very cool. All right, let's go to the next one. I'm having so much fun with this. All right, <laughs> here we go. Me too, Kevin. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. My name is Tara, and I was wondering if you could give me, well, me and my husband, a little bit of advice on dressing for job interviews. We're both actually interviewing at new companies this month, and neither of us have been in the job interview game for, for probably five years or more. I've heard that wearing a suit and tie or a blazer and heels for a woman used to be the way to go, but that some new companies can think that you're stuffy or won't fit the job culture. Um, yeah, we would love your advice. Is it better to overdress or is it better to be cool and approachable? Um, you're always fashionable and I know you've talked a lot about dressing for your job before. So we would love to get your advice. Thank you. 
Well, Tara, you've come to the right place. I have the fashionista <laughs> man right beside me here. Aaron, I'm going to let you take a stab at this one. Sure. Please. She's raising a really good question for both men and women. Yeah. They're back in the job market. They want to look sharp. They want to win the job, yep. basically. I think the, the, the first thing you need to do is do your research. Figure out what the corporate culture is like at the, the place that you're actually applying for. Because one of the issues, if you're going to like a, a cool like tech startup, I, I really feel like it does, to some degree, depend on... The, the, the business that you're actually going and applying for. Um, and so do your research. So if, it, if it's a cool tech startup in the Valley, what are you saying? You're gonna be a little hipper in terms of what clothing you're wearing? I think you a do, little more f free? You don't have the pressure to dress. It might not require a suit and tie, a, 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 a something super professional. Yeah. It might be a business casual, or a business casual type of environment. Um, but I always would say err on the side of overdressing versus underdressing 100% of the time. Um, that is your one shot, and your employer knows that it doesn't get any better than right now. Like, this is the best. If you are going in for an interview, you know that if this person didn't shave, if you know this person didn't, you know, didn't wear pantyhose or whatever the situation is, it's never getting any better. And so I would say that you, if you want to dress and be cool and hip later, that's fine. That's for HR to work out. But right now, you need to be respectful of the position you're going after, but also do your due diligence in identifying what the corporate culture is. Because if you go in in a three-piece suit and it doesn't require that, you may be overdressing for the potential job or interview. It's, it's a great answer. I'm going to take a stab at it, too, because I actually interview a lot of people. And, and I've learned that the, the key words you just brought up there, Aaron, you only get a first time to do a first impression, only once. That only happens once when you walk in that room and you look at each other. So clothing is really interesting because it, it's different for men and women. Men have fewer choices, particularly if you're going for a job in financial services. What's happened on both the East and the West Coast over the last five years is the tie has come back as a sign of respect that you care. If you're in the financial services, you're in an industry of trust and the styles have become very, very clean, and the tie, and also, you know, the, the, the colors have become more muted. It's very interesting to watch that happen. It happens in San Francisco, Los Angeles, I see it in New York, Miami, Chicago, and I travel all those cities. People are looking crisp, clean, and subtle for the, for the side of men. Now, women, this is very controversial because if you look at some of the codes that are now written by large corporations about women's clothing, they're putting in the concept of not showing too much chest. They don't want controversial dressing. They don't want it to be flirtatious because of all the Me Too things that are going on in the world, and they're trying to tone down. And believe me, in big companies, people meet each other and stuff happens. That's just men and women doing their thing. But how you clothe, if, it's con if you clothe yourself in a controversial way, that's going to hurt you in a job interview. Are they risking something? That's the employer saying to themselves, and they make notes about this stuff, I can guarantee you, and very often they're asking for a picture of you before you show up, just so they can see what you're wearing. Women have to be very careful that they look professional. That's what matters. Whatever that means to you, taking into account your idea about the company you're going to work in, but if you come in with anything controversial, that hurts. And that's why there are dress codes. And that's why companies, as they grow, just past 25 people, HR starts to put in place dress codes because they don't want to cause tension in the workplace. Great question, though. I loved it. Never had one like that before. And good it came when you were on the set because you're the fashionista guy. You keep telling me that. You overestimate my ability. Well, come on. <laughs> you told me it twice on Shark Tank, remember? All right. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. This is Andres from Colombia. At the moment, my brother and I have a hamburger and a hot dog business with three outlets. My question is, if it is better to grow slowly or seek funds to grow faster? We're selling over a million dollars a year. We've Whoa. been open for two years only. Thank you. A million bucks in three stands. The kid knows what he's doing. You he can does. live off that. You could. You're probably making about 30% margin on product like that, I would think. You know, bringing in 300,000. Maybe it's between 200 and 300,000. I'm going to give him that if he's running it. So that's a good question. You first. You go right. nuts, you borrow money to expand, or you just grow slow and steady? So here's the thing that you got to figure out. If you raise money, how are you going to use that money in order to take your business to that next level? One of the big mistakes that I see a lot of entrepreneurs and, and businesses get into is they take money because they think, hey, I need more money. 
but they don't know how they're going to spend it in order to actually generate more revenue. I am a firm believer that you never, you know, it sort of goes back to the whole debt thing. I don't want that on my personal life. I don't want that in my business unless I know if I can use, and you've said this all the time, I just want to add fuel to the fire, right? Or, or cash to the fire and make it burn bigger. Gasoline to the fire. That's what it is. And so unless you know how you're going to spend that money and you've got the, the infrastructure in place in order to be able to scale your business bigger, stronger, more profitable based on you taking money, I say until you know how you're going to do that until you have a roadmap of I'm going to spend X, I'm going to get this back. Don't take the money. Do not fall into the trap because if you take money from friends and family, they'll let it slide. But once you go into that institutional money, then they're calling you. Then they're like, hey, why aren't you selling 27 more burgers a day? And do you want to answer to those people? That's my question to you. I, I think it's a great question because clearly they figured out the model. Three stands doing a million bucks. I'm going to say that they're probably making $250,000 pre-tax on that. It can be a pretty good margin business. You're selling direct to the customer cash, so you don't have a lot of credit you have to worry about or bad loans or anything else. What I would do is I would open one more stand using the cash flow of the other th three in a very close geography. In other words, just make it a place that you can actually go visit every day. I love businesses that spin cash and you can live off. I hate debt. So I, it's, it's just what happens is you have to start hiring people relying on them to have the same fire you have that maintain these stands. Sounds like a bit of a family business, which I think is terrific. You don't have to become McDonald's to have a successful business. So I would cool it. I'd open one more with the cash you've got, then one after that, grow it slowly, zero debt. That's for other people, not you, my friend, but a great question. Uh, Great answer. Yeah. Great answer, Kevin. It's like you've done this before. Yeah, well, I, I hate that just like you do. Okay, here we go. One more time with feeling, Aaron. I'm here. What is the biggest deal you made on Shark Tank? There it is. <laughs> That's a simple question, right? Saying no to Aaron. That was my biggest deal. And it was a huge mistake. The guy's rocking around with maybe 20 million in sales. It's more of Barbara's problem. She's the one that missed it. The largest deal in Shark Tank history actually is mine. It's the, the company called Plated. Um, and it's measured by the biggest exit. It was $300 million. They came on Shark Tank, did not get a deal. They were asking for such a ridiculous valuation. Two guys just like you. We ran into them a year later in the streets of New York. They, ta they told me where they were at, and they said, look, we'd love to get a shark into the deal. And I then did the deal a year afterwards, and that was sold only 24 months after that to Albertsons for $300 million. So they had nothing when they came on Shark Tank. That's the biggest X that we've seen so far in Shark Tank history, but it just shows you the dream is alive. You can come on Shark Tank with a great idea, you know, get an investment from a shark, and together we can use the platform to blow it up big. There's been so many cases of that. And great entrepreneurs show up every day. And, you know, all joking aside, Aaron's probably one of the best examples of what it takes to get on Shark Tank. You need energy. You need, you need to show that you really care and are passionate about the business as he was. And he got on twice. Now, Barbara screwed up. That's her problem. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. My main question is, how do you make money with no money? Also, how do you come up with a good business idea? It seems like there's just too much competition everywhere and all the good business ideas are taken. Andrea, don't sound depressed. I don't like that tone. I'll tell you something. Nobody has a monopoly on great ideas. Nobody. There's always somebody with a problem that needs to be solved. And that is the essence of a great business opportunity. Look around you in the world and see the problems people are having. Keep your eyes open, and when you discover one that you think you can fix, that is the beginning of a business, my friend. That's how it starts. So don't be down, and don't say that all the great ideas are taken. That's never the case. There's always the next great idea, and that's what's wonderful about being an entrepreneur. You've got to keep sort of your mind open and your eyes open and always be looking for opportunity. And don't be depressed. I don't like that tone. Let's get happy, and let's get focused, and let's get to work. And by the way, the greatest companies ever started were many that were started with no money. It's not about money. It's about solving somebody's problem. If you can solve a problem, you can start a business, even with no cash. You're going to provide as much as you can for the little as you can to start it and prove it out. You get a product or service that people are buying and they're saying, this works for me, you're solving a problem. That's the beginning of a great journey. Good luck, my friend. Uh -huh.
Hello, Mr. Wonderful. If you were mid-20s again with no debt and 300k in liquid cash that's currently being invested, uh, what would you do with it? Oh, definitely. I mean, look, it's a great question. 300k, that's a lot of dough. I'm, I'm impressed. I don't know how you got that, but it sounds pretty good. Um, at that young age, I would generally go into more equities than fixed income because you've got a very long horizon. But the, the key is the market's at all-time highs these days, so you've got to layer in. You can't put it all to work at the same time. I would put 15% to work today and wait three months, then put another 15% to work. And you kind of, you just don't know when there's going to be a correction. And if you go in over a long period of time, you'll buy some at lower prices than, than they are today, maybe. And I don't know this. Nobody does. That's the whole point. But the key to successful investing is diversification. That's why I like to use ETFs, exchange-traded funds that have many, many stocks in one ticker. They're inexpensive and very low cost. And what I like about them is they're transparent and they're very tax efficient. That's probably the easiest way to do it. But definitely prices have really gone up quite a bit and you kind of want to wait, um, I think, and put in 15%, 50% three months later, maybe 50% three months after that. And keep some cash around because you don't know what's going to happen. Great investing is around, you know, investing when things are low and waiting for them to go higher, but you never know what the market's going to do. So layering over time. Great question though, thank you. Sort of an Almond Brothers kind of bluesy kind of thing. Perfect to set up for George. Let's see what he's got. Hello, Mr. O'Leary. My name is George Kuchikishvili, calling in from California. I'm 21 years of age, and I've always known that I've wanted to be an entrepreneur. The only issue is I cannot find my passion. If you watch any YouTube video, they, the main advice they give you is find your passion and excel in it. The thing is, I know I can excel in anything I put my mind into, but I don't know what to put it into. So my question would be, how can you identify this passion? What's the best way of exposing yourself to, to certain situations that may give you a spark or something? George, well, I should call you passionless, George. Don't worry about finding the passion. The, the key to entrepreneurship is to really look for opportunity. And what I think is great is instead of just saying, I'm going to start up on my own, when you find something you are interested in, whether it be technology or manufacturing or the arts or whatever it is, be an apprentice for a year. This is old school. That way you can find out if the passion is really in you. You can actually steep yourself in and say, look, I'm a really good worker. Let's say you find a company you want to work for. You go in and see the CEO, the man or woman running it and say, you don't have to pay me. I'm so passionate, I'd like to show you how good I am as someone who can create value for you. I know this sounds, what do you mean don't pay me? When, when, I, you know, when I meet somebody who comes up to me and says, I want to work for one of your companies and I'll do it for free because I'm so good at what I do and I can make things much better for you. I can solve problems, I can enhance profits, I can help you achieve your goals. You don't think I listen to that? There's somebody that's got passion, passion to try and work and help. And of course, if they can actually achieve the things they're talking about, I'm going to hire them. Apprentice gets you in the door, is my point. And you don't have to know with certainty what it is that you love, but you've got to go try. And the key is apprenticeship. I got lots of people that work for me for nothing just because so they get exposed to all the things that we do around all the companies I'm an investor in. And those are the men and women I think are just terrific because they're, they're, they're in it because they want to try. You think about that. This is from Cindy Rose. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. I got into your channel recently and have watched the last seven episodes. You spend a lot of time talking about the traits of successful people. And for the most part, I have enjoyed the shows, but you really leave a lot out. What about diet? What about exercise? What about fashion? What about grooming? What about drugs? What about alcohol? What about sleep? I'm interested in where all these fit into a successful lifestyle. I really think you should take the time to answer these questions 
because I'm going to bet many other people want the same information. Okay, grooming. This is an interesting one. I feel that when you get up in the morning and you work out, you know, my routine is I get up, I work out, I have breakfast. I get up pretty early. I get a lot of work done early on. I get my three things done. But before I go out, particularly if I'm going to spend time outside, one of the problems I've got is I'm always putting on makeup. I have makeup on right now. Generally, I put it on and I got a lot of real estate. You don't want to be shiny on TV. So I'm putting this stuff on my, you know, my, my golden dome a lot and a ton of it under my eyes like this and around my nose and here where it gets shiny. If you see people that are on TV, they look great on the camera. When you see them in person, they come off the set, they look like they're dead. They got so much makeup packed on. You know, I don't endorse products that I don't use personally. I just don't want to do it. If I'm going to get a sponsor, which I have, you know, on my YouTube channel, I'm going to use the product. I want to know all about it and I want it to work for me. Why would I endorse it for somebody else if I don't try it on myself? You got to eat your own cooking. I really believe that. Tish Hanley has a scrub um, that I've really started to use and I'm particularly around, you know, my eyes and my nose. To, and I mean, you know, it sounds crazy talking about this, but it actually has become part of my routine. The wash is a basic wash for your face, morning or night for me, and the scrub takes all the crap out of my pores. Skin care for men, who knew? I'm using it now because I want to keep looking like Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> and naturally, when I invite Tiege Handling to be a sponsor of my video because they use their products, I want them to give a little certain je ne sais quoi to my base. I want them to give you a deal. I want them to give you something extra special. So they're sponsoring this video today they're hooking up my viewers with a special offer. Just click on the first link in the description to get a free toiletry drop bag with your first box. So I, you know, I do a shout out for their products because they work and I hate perfumey stuff and theirs isn't. So I, I don't want you know, a smell coming off it. It's, it's just clean, good stuff. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shameless endorsement for them, but it's good. I bring it to the idea of grooming. I'll tell you why. In your career, in doing deals, in being an entrepreneur, in being a leader, in, in being a great employee, whatever you're going to do, you want to walk into a room and you want to feel good, you want to look good, and that involves grooming and fashion. Finding out what you like to feel like, what you, how you want to present yourself. When it comes to financial services like O shares and bean stocks and all the fintech stuff I invest in, and I'm in New York, or I'm in LA, or I'm in Zurich, or I'm in London, and I travel to these places for business. I like the crisp suit look. I got a classic look. Some people think I'm nuts. It's always the same. I got 25 of the same suits, 25 of the same shirts, 25 tie pins, 25 black ties. I vary my watches. As you know, they all have red bands, and I've got a very broad collection of watches, but consistency is the red band. That's my thing. And I, you know, change my watch almost every day, sometimes three times a day. Depends where I'm, where I'm, what I'm doing. I, you know, I, I travel with watches and I like to have a sort of a fashion look. And people say, well, that's kind of nuts. Why, why would you need more than one watch? Why would you need a watch at all? Why don't you just um, use your phone? You can get the perfect time off your phone. It's always accurate. I get that. I like the fashion statement. I like the, the art in the dial. I like the way it works with the cufflinks. So that's, that's, a, that's a grooming slash fashion thing. And you got to find your groove. You got to find your look. You can shake it up, but people get to know you about whether you've got that, that vibe, that fashion vibe. You know, take Barbara Corcoran. I know about her. She always is dressed real sharp. I mean, she always looks spectacular. Lori, the same way. These women know how to present themselves and they have a look. Barbara's different than Lori, but I'm just making an example of people I've been working with for 12 years. I know when they walk out, I'm not just talking about on the Shark Tank set. You go to anywhere with either of them and they are dressed to kill. I get it. That's a certain persona that they're projecting. That's a certain look. I look around the other sharks, Damon, really into some eclectic style, but that's his thing. He's the FUBU guy. Robert has a West Coasty breezy kind of thing. These are all, and of course, Cuban likes to just wear sweats because he's saying something with that. He can wear anything he wants. That's what he's saying, and I get that too. But the point is, it becomes a little bit about who you are. And I think you should spend some time 
thinking about it. And, and you don't need a lot of really expensive stuff. And I always err towards buying something really good and having less of it. You don't need like 15 jeans. You need three fantastic pair. You don't need 20 leather jackets. Maybe you need two. I mean, that's my whole point. My suit thing, I like the consistency of my look, so I wear that. You know, I've gone overboard on watches, but that's just my own thing. But I'm trying to make a point about something here that becomes part of who you are. And it happens to you in your late teens. You start to get a feel for the way you want to project yourself. And I think that's very cool. I think it's really, really worth thinking about. Make that decision. Consult with others. There's so much stuff online, obviously, but it's, it's what makes you feel good. You know, that's, that's what really matters. What makes you feel good? What makes you confident to walk out there and do your thing? That's how you should groom, and that's how you should fashion up. You kind of have to make up your mind how you want to present yourself. And if you're comfortable with the way you look, be cool with it. That's it. I mean, look, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to affect your performance. That's not the case, unless you're some kind of fine-tuned athlete or something. But I also don't want to let it drag me down in terms of how I feel and how much energy I've got. I care about energy levels. That's what matters. If you're an entrepreneur, if you, if you really want to, if you want to run, you got to have some energy. And sometimes, and when I mean run, I mean you want to run through your day. I don't mean running around. You can do that too as exercise. Energy to me and weight are somehow combined. And you know, I like everybody else tried dieting. I tried all the apps. What I found works is you have to get into a lifestyle groove. Because um, weight is really a very simple equation. Calories in, calories out. And depending on how much you burn a day, whether you're burning 1,600, 1,800, 2,100, whatever it is, you're going to either gain or lose weight. But you want to keep constant weights. So you got to kind of think about that in the context of what you're eating all day long. Because maybe I want to only eat 2,000 calories a day. I don't want it to be 50% in wine. So I have to constrain myself in terms of how much wine I actually drink. But my point is, if you get into a, a, a groove where you have, to me, I have a normal breakfast. I got to eat something in the morning right after I work out. And then I don't eat anything again until lunch. And it's those in-between periods of snacking and eating crap that's no good for you that really helps you keep weight off or, or packs it on. Over a long period of time, you've got to look at it that way. I don't really buy into the super diet, taking all the supplements and all that stuff. I believe in good food. I believe in food in moderation. But I, I really want to be able to try everything wherever I go and just be pragmatic about it. You know, if there's certain things that you're allergic to or, you know, non-dairy and all that, and then everybody says to me, why don't you become a vegan? Well, I am a vegan. I'm, I'm a modified vegan. I don't eat meat on Tuesday from breakfast till noon. Hey, it's my, my tip of the hat to vegans. I eat less red meat. I eat more fish. I eat more chicken. I, I moderate it all, but yeah, so I'm a modified vegan. I like to say that. <laughs> Anyways, my point is you got to eat well, not too much of any one thing. And if you can, you know, and if you want to modify your weight, you have to do it over a really long period of time. Like set a goal of losing seven or eight pounds in six months. That's my, you know, you have all these diets, you crash diet, lose this, crash diet, lose that. So all you can do is crash. You got to just modify your eating habits slightly and it has a big impact over a period of time. Okay, so let me tie that to alcohol for a second because I want to talk a little bit more about that. And I like Cindy Rose's question about how this fits into a successful lifestyle. Let's talk about alcohol. Let me give you some do's and don'ts just from my point of view, okay? I'm in the wine business, I drink, but I never do it when I'm working. Why? Because it only takes one mistake and you get canceled. And I don't mean just canceled off TV. You can get canceled out of life. You've seen it happen. Social media is cruel. People get drunk, they say stupid things. Maybe you shouldn't tweet. Maybe you shouldn't go to Insta when you're drinking. Maybe you should really think it through before you become public while you're relaxing. I'm not saying getting drunk, but just some rules about drinking. Here's some other rules. I've interviewed thousands of people in my time. I've never hired anybody where I could smell alcohol on their breath. Not because I think they're alcoholics, not at all. In my view, 
this is a personal opinion. They didn't take that interview very seriously if they had a drink beforehand. Or maybe they had nerves and they couldn't do the interview without having a drink. That also I don't like. In life, you're going to have to make decisions about this stuff. And when you drink, and basically for most stuff you drink, people can smell it. If no one else in the room has had anything to drink and you have, people are going to smell it. What does that say about you? In my view, not good things because you've done it during the work day. Now in Europe, sometimes when I go over there to do business and around wine and I'm in with, with others in the winemaking industry, yeah, we drink at lunch. I mean, that's, you know, it's a, sometimes a Burgundian or, you know, if you're in Bordeaux, that, that, that's happening, but you're dealing with the craft of making wine and you're in the wine business. Slightly different. I'm in New York City having a meeting with an executive or talking to a producer about something I'm working on at television at one in the afternoon, I'm not drinking. Just not going to do it. I can wait. And when the market's over, for me, my routine is 4, 4.30. I've been doing this ever since I've been involved in financial services. Um, yeah, I'll go have a drink with somebody. And that's after the market's over. I don't drive anywhere after that, I'll tell you that. But this thing with alcohol is kind of weird. And I'll tell you why I say it. I've got lots of friends that have completely stopped drinking altogether. And I know why. Not necessarily full-blown alcoholics, but it changed their personality. They were different people, even after a couple of glasses of wine. They were not their original self. And what would happen is, the next day, someone would say to them, you know, hey, listen, um, you know, last night, were you drunk? Do you remember saying this or that? If that starts happening to you, alcohol is actually changing your behavior. If it happens consistently and people comment about it to you, you could have a problem. Not necessarily being an alcoholic, but letting something like that change other people's perception of you. Alcoholism breaks up families, destroys wealth, causes huge fractions between friends, sometimes for lifetime periods. Nothing tastes that good that it's worth destroying your life over. I don't care what booze you're talking about. Do not let alcohol define who you are. That's my advice on that. Great segue into drugs, okay? Now, drugs is a whole different ballgame. I don't do drugs because I don't like what it does to my abilities to process information. My day is packed with stuff that I deal with. Sometimes it's problems, sometimes it's opportunities. I don't want to make decisions when my thinking's altered. Now, I know there's a huge debate about cannabis and the merits of it and all that. I never invested in cannabis. Why? Because all the companies that showed me deals never were able to separate the medicinal opportunity, should there be one, with CBDs, etc., and recreational. I don't invest in recreational marijuana because it's not legal in every state, and I do business in every state. And there's something called the RICO statute, and it's a Schedule One narcotic. I don't want to fight with that stuff. I don't want to be involved in it. So I don't do it, and I don't invest in it. Someone said to me recently, hey, wait a minute, didn't you invest in psychedelics? Yeah, and I did. I, I, I have invested in a company called MindMed, which does, it's now public, and it, it basically um, is doing scheduled trials with the FDA, level one, level two, level three, in microdosing psychedelics to see if in some way it can help with opioid addiction or anxiety or alcoholism and all these afflictions that there really haven't been any new drugs for in 35 years. That intrigues me because it's legal and it's not being done recreationally. But that's different than drugs. Same thing in that interview thing I talked about earlier. And I said, okay, wait a sec. You come to me and this has happened. You know, sometimes very interesting engineers come in. I know they're stoned. I can smell it if it's, you know, if they've blown a joint, they've had a, I can smell it. It's just me. The answer is no. I don't care if we're in a state where it's legal. I don't like drugs because I'm pretty happy just marching on the way I am and I don't want to change. But I also want to, I don't want to take any risks. I don't want to mess with stuff that messes with my head. Just a personal opinion. And you can say, well, you know, I like to smoke a spliff once in a while. I get all that. I'm just telling you what I do. Generally speaking, the people that I've known to be very, very successful, they get high on winning. 
They get high on moving forward. They get high on business and being successful. I will say this about one drug that, you know, I've been around for years because in the, in the television industry, you see this all the time. You see it in the bathrooms or whatever, cocaine. That's a bad drug. It's a bad drug in every way. I don't know anybody that's been able to manage that drug. Anybody that I know that's gotten into it for a long period of time, it's been a real bad outcome, including death. Really sucks. But destroyed lives, destroyed marriages, destroyed businesses. I mean, talk about changing behavior. Talk about unhealthy. I mean, it's just brutal. And I get people's attraction to it, but I don't believe that that's a drug that you can have a little bit of. That's not how that one works. So you're gonna to have to make your own decision. But for me, I don't want anybody working in any of my companies that's doing coke, because I know the outcome. It's never good. And when I find out they are, I'm sorry. That's, you know, I try and get them help, but very often it's not a drug you can get off easily. And I'm just, I'm just saying, I understand addiction, I got it. But if you have a choice, is what I'm saying, and we're, we're still on the, the cocaine issue, you don't find cocaine associated with success. You just don't. You don't. Not over a short period of time or a long period of time. So my advice to you, don't mess with it. It's that simple. If you can completely avoid it, do that. If you have to try it, be very cautious and conscious of where it takes a lot of people to a really bad place. Okay, last on Cindy Rose's list was what about sleep? Now, I never thought about sleep. It was not a big deal to me. Sleep when you can, get some rest. Then I joined this group called the Longevity League. It's, it's a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs that gather together every couple of months. Sometimes it's a Zoom call, sometimes it's, it's a dinner, depending on what city. They're all from different places, so sometimes they meet, you know. But they're interested in understanding how to maintain a really healthy lifestyle, both for balance of work, you know, in life and everything else, but there are certain things you can do that are very, very healthy. And one of them is sleep. Now, I never really got into it, but REM sleep, deep sleep, how much sleep, you know, I, I used to think I don't need eight hours sleep. Well, you do actually. Um, it really, really helps you become a much better and more productive person. Now, there's all kinds of devices on the market, um, you know, there's, there's watches. I don't wear those electronic watches. I wouldn't be seen dead with one. I prefer the art of a handcrafted piece, obviously. But there's rings and other things. And you put them on, this is one of them, and it basically tracks your sleep. And it's, there, there's, there's dozens of devices. You can choose whatever you like. But the point is, monitoring sleep is really interesting because you start to realize certain things about your lifestyle. I'm really good at taking a 20 minute snooze in the middle of the day when I'm traveling somewhere and I'm in a car, you know, back of a limo or in a plane flying somewhere. And I would have thought that's the same valuable sleep that it would be in the middle of the night. It's not. Now, one of the things about sleep you should know, um, and this is, I found this out just, you know, by just monitoring my own sleep. I love wine. I'm in the wine business. I've talked about that a lot. I love to drink wine with dinners. It turns out the later you drink any alcohol, the more it screws up your sleep, which is heartbreaking for me because I just love wine. And I've had to modify a little bit. Instead of, you know, drinking wine, if, let's say I'm going to have dinner at 8 o'clock or something, or even worse, it's going to be much later because Miami, where I hang out quite, quite a bit, it's a very late lifestyle. Sometimes dinner's at 11. Um, I don't drink at 11 o'clock at night anymore because it totally screws up my sleep. It reduces my REM sleep and it reduces my deep sleep and you can see the results off any device that monitors your sleep. It's brutal. So, you know, maybe you have a drink at six or seven. I mean, I don't know if you can do this, but I'm just telling you over a long period of time, screwing up your sleep every night because you're drinking is really stupid. That's my view. So you have to modify. Maybe on weekends you ignore this, but at some point you really don't want to mess up your REM sleep and your deep sleep with alcohol. That's the one big change that I've put into my life and it's really helped me quite a bit. It gives me a lot more energy in the morning. You'd be amazed how fantastic you feel after a solid eight hours sleep with a good cycle of deep sleep and REM sleep. I mean, you get up bouncing out, you're just ready to take the world on. It's fantastic. What screws that up? Too much alcohol late at night or any alcohol really close to when you go to sleep. 
And I don't, it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, it, it, technically you'd be better off drinking wine at nine in the morning, which is crazy, I'm not recommending that, but you wanna get it as far away from when you're sleeping as you possibly can. Either you give up alcohol completely, which I'm not prepared to do because I'm in that business, or you modify your use of it. So I, I've got a couple of reasons for this, the sleep thing. I don't wanna do too many calories knowing it's 160 calories a glass, so maybe a couple of glasses of wine three max a Reno, like that's max, because that's a ton of calories, but it takes a toll on your sleep. So that's kind of a little bit of a snapshot about um, how for, for you know Cindy Rose, all these things fit together. You're gonna find that successful people have one way or another dealt with drugs, dealt with alcohol, worked out the whole sleep thing, and figured out grooming and fashion. They found a path through all that, and they made a lifestyle choice. You can too, but it's got to be conscious. You, you're going to want to do that. And, and, and for the guys that are you know, constantly worried about their weight, eh, get over it. I mean, look, as long as it doesn't make you unhappy about the way you feel about yourself, you can be any body style or any weight. That's cool. But if you want to modify it, which seems to be an obsession with about a third of the population, you have to change your lifestyle. There's no, for me, dieting just doesn't work, you know, and I've, uh, and it doesn't really work for most people. Starving yourself, making yourself miserable, really stupid. Changing your lifestyle, small modifications. Watch over months how you, sh you shed the pounds. So we talked about a lot of stuff on this. Um, I've dealt with all these issues myself. I've kind of found my path. Bottom line, let's end it this way. You want to get up in the morning and feel great about the day you're going to be in. Whatever it is you do. And so much of that is based around things you have control over. What you eat, what you drink, the drugs you take, you know, how much sleep you get. You are gifted with control over those things in many, many, many ways. And it's really up to you to make the decision to do it or not. But that's the part I like the most about Cindy Rose's question. Pretty well everything on that list, she can do right or she can do wrong. If you like that video, wait till you see my next one. Don't forget to click right over here and subscribe.